The book of Jeremiah is a clarion call for all to return to the Lord before judgment falls. Contextually, the prophet's message was directed at the inhabitants of Judah as he warned of coming judgment for their rebellion against God and their subsequent replacement of God. Throughout the pages of this book, we are granted access into the burning and broken heart of one of God's chosen prophets. In the person of Jeremiah, we see the power of being broken when harnessed by heaven. In the preaching of Jeremiah, we see unrelenting passion when fueled by the word's conviction. And in the prophecies of Jeremiah, we see how retribution and redemption are different sides of the same coin. So just as ancient Babylon was about to be the system of bondage that God would deploy to deal with Judah's rebellion, likewise in these last days, it will be mystery Babylon that God uses to purge his people and punish the rebel. You see, the calling to repentance always precedes the coming of judgment. In other words, before God acts in wrath, he always speaks in warning. Such are these days. This is Jeremiah, the warning before the wrath. All right, so if you have your Bibles open, which I love seeing, we're in Jeremiah chapter one. We're gonna complete it tonight, believe it or not, and that is a big miracle, as Jay says in the front, because there's a lot of content here, and what we've already had access to is the background of the book and the backbone of the book. We've been introduced to this prophet. His name's Jeremiah. His name has double meaning. It means Yahweh either throws throwing down, thrusting, or Yahweh plants, grounds. And it's interesting because in his name is his calling. Jeremiah was a prophet that God raised up, and his ministry spans about 40 plus years. He would prophesy and preach and live this amazing personality, which I believe if we take a few pages from the book and apply to our own lives, we will be introduced to the power of being broken when harnessed by heaven. Just total brokenness yet useful to God. He ministers during the final five kings of Judah. Now you have to understand, Israel traditionally, historically, was one people. There was a division in the nation. They were divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom went by the name Israel. The southern kingdom went by the name Judah. Both, obviously, under the umbrella of God's chosen people, Israel, but based on that division, that split, northern kingdom began to form and the southern kingdom began to form. The northern kingdom, according to idolatry, God raised up the Assyrians to deal with his people. Judah would have been privy to the destruction of their northern neighbors, and yet here you have God raising up another prophet to warn Judah about a similar judgment that would fall upon them if they did not return to the Lord. That's one of the themes, returning to the Lord. However, we know this, sowing and reaping. What you sow, you grow. There's consequences based on the decisions we make. We all know that. Just because I return to the Lord does not mean the consequences erase. So often in life, individually, collectively, as a country, there are consequences based on the decisions that we have made. Nonetheless, the heart needs to return to the Lord. We are given access to this calling. It's specific to Jeremiah, but there's application for us too. God actually tells Jeremiah that he was called even before he was born, before there was breath, before he was on earth, God commissioned him in heaven. It's very intimate. And I want you to have the application in your own life to recognize you are here for a purpose. God has created you for a reason, for a purpose. And it's only wise to look to him for that purpose. Not in the things around you, not in your family of origin, not in what you do for a living, but in actually the one that gave you that purpose we're gonna begin by a quick review in the verses from the last time we were together. Jeremiah chapter one, verse four, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, I knew you intimately. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said Jeremiah, ah, Lord God, 
Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. He uses inexperience, his youthfulness, but also when he says I cannot speak, he's actually referencing he isn't a good public speaker. He has nothing to say. God says back to him, and I love it, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. In other words, it's not about your experience. It's not about your eloquence. It's about your heart's obedience. And you're gonna go where I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. It gets even better. You're gonna go where I send you. You're gonna speak what I tell you. Do not be afraid of their faces. Now why? For I am there to deliver you, says the Lord. Like, don't worry about their response. Don't worry about the face, which is obviously an expression that denotes an expression of approval or disapproval. Don't worry about their responses, Jeremiah. You speak what I have asked you to speak. You go where I have asked you to go. Go where I send, God says. Speak what I intend, God says. And by the way, don't worry about their response I'm the God who will bring your defense. Don't worry about how they're gonna receive you. And I think when you understand the DNA here of this calling, before he was born, God gave him the gift. He came into that gift. God calls him to that gift. So there's a discovery, there's a development, and then there's a deployment to that gift. Interestingly, when this took place, you began to see Josiah, which was one of the kings who brought reformation to Judah, you began to see perhaps a change in society. It was on the up and up. Things were looking good. And yet here, God drops Jeremiah in the midst of that and tells him to begin to preach judgment. Begin to preach repentance. And don't worry about how people respond to the message. There's so many lessons to learn before we even get into the new verses that those who face God can face anyone and face anything. If you face God, before your day begins, you face God, you can face anything or anyone in your day. The other lesson that we must grasp, because we're gonna see it show up throughout the entire study, is that when you know God stands with you, well, ultimately, he stands with you because you stand with him. Let me get that out of the way. Right, so it's not like he's going to stand with us when we're out of line with his word. He stands with us because we're standing on his word. So he stands with his word. So if you know God stands with you, it doesn't matter who stands against you in your life. It does not matter who comes against you when you're standing on God's word. That is like the role of an ambassador. An ambassador sent to a different country or a different kingdom to represent the sending nation, the sending kingdom, the sending country, the sending authority. That's what an ambassador does. They go into other areas and the goal would be diplomacy. Every ambassador should be diplomatic. That means to broker relationships and develop rapports. But at the end of the day, it's not always just about diplomacy or being diplomatic. In the Bible, it's about being dogmatic. Now, that often is a word that is used in the negative. Don't be dogmatic. Don't be so opinionated. And I'm saying to the purest sense of the word dogmatism, to be dogmatic is to say, this is true, and I'm unwilling to adopt any other idea that is in competition or contrary to the word of God. And I wanna be as tolerant or intolerant as the word is. If the word does not tolerate certain behaviors or sins, then as an ambassador to a foreign country, I have to be willing to stand on those hard truths. This is Jeremiah's calling. This is not an easy calling. Be diplomatic, but always dogmatic, right? Our ambassadorship is different than any other ambassador. Ambassadors go and they represent their country. They're sent with the authority. They come with the same responsibilities as the sending kingdom. But our ambassadorship is so much more powerful than that. Our ambassadorship as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we're not just sent with the power of our king. That's enough. You go in the name of Christ. You actually even get to go with the presence of your king. It's one of his promises. He's always with us. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. 
Imagine if we grasp that we not only have the authority and the power of our sending kingdom, but we come actually with the presence of our king. And you're going to need to remember that because you are sent into hostile territory. Hostile territory that is not going to receive you. In fact, they're not interested in your kingdom and your king. And they are going to actually be hostile and malicious towards your kingdom and your king. And you need to understand who's with you when you go. We need to remember that the authority that we stand under is the authority of scripture. There is no greater or higher authority than that. Did you know that? As a Christian who has the Holy Spirit within them, As the Apostle Paul wrote, you are ambassadors for Christ and your mission, he's like begging the church at Corinth to recognize their mission. He says, I implore you, be reconciled to God. That was his heart. Be, be, you are at war with God and I'm an ambassador of his kingdom and I've come to tell you, he wants you to be reconciled to him. And he's already paved the way, made the way and provided a peace offering, a peace offering was his son, the very same king that I come in the name of, with the power of, and the presence of, I come to represent him. And there's something in international communities that's called diplomatic immunity. Now, of course, it protects an ambassador in a foreign land that perhaps might get caught up with some of the different customs or laws of that land, and they're basically not to be tried, they're to be sent back to their sending country. And and that's even if there's misconduct by an ambassador. But I'm simply saying, as a Christian ambassador of Christ, sent into a hostile territory, I come with diplomatic immunity, which means I'm not gonna adopt or conform to the customs or the policies or the laws of the land that are contrary to the laws of my land. As a citizen of heaven that God sends me, I am not worried about what the world can do to me because I go back to the original point. When you know God stands with you, it doesn't matter who stands against you. Remember, you know he stands with you because you s- decided to stand on his word. All right, this is kind of like the build up here. Jeremiah, I'm about to send you into some very rough areas and you're gonna have to speak as I speak and you're gonna have to see as I see. Jeremiah 1, 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. How do you like that job description? (laughs) Right, before you get to the job description, the Lord puts forth his hand and touches his mouth, okay, the tongue, and tells him, I put my words in your mouth And the reason that is so important for the believer today is to know that since God's word, this book right here is our authority. It's our authority over every area of life. There's no area of your life that the word of the Lord does not have authority over. Sexuality, morality, the infrastructure of the family, how any given society should function, It's the word of God that gives us this authority. So guess what, Christian? You should speak it without apology. You do not have to apologize when you speak God's word. When you speak the truth, you do not have to feel ashamed when you speak truth. But we gotta do it in love, pastor. And I'm going, you can't actually have true truth without love embedded in it. So those that speak the truth are doing so because they actually love. They love the souls that they intend to reach and they know they have to tell them the truth in order to set them free from the bondage or the sin that has them shackled. We've taken these ideas like love. Today's love is love and you gotta be, you gotta make sure you like sprinkle pixie dust before you tell the truth to someone. It's like, no, that's not, there's nowhere in scripture. Jesus told it how it was because he had a heart to save the lost. That's why he came. We do not apologize. We have the authority given to us by God, but please understand my heart on this. This is not a license to be rude. This is a license to speak the truth. You are given permission to speak the truth in your life. 
to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, and you do not have to apologize for it. The job description, it was always fascinating to me. Verse 10 tells us, this is what God has set him over. The nations, he set Jeremiah, this young prophet over the kingdoms. And of course, four terms of his mission are a demolition and two are construction. You can almost categorize rooting out, pulling down, destroying, throwing down, building and planting into agriculture, farming, planting. Obviously a farmer plants seed, but he has to plow the field. So he might have to tear away some weeds and some roots before he plants the seed. That's the first work that must be done. You must get rid of the weeds. You must get rid of the roots. And often that happens by a plow. And then the seed is planted and then the seed is watered. Then the seed brings forth its crop or its fruit. The other category is construction, right? A builder, architecture. This is what he's telling Jeremiah he is tasked to do. You are commissioned, Jeremiah, to do four demolitions. Root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, and two constructions, build and plant. So it's just like an emphasis more on the fact that, yo, you're gonna have to tear some things down before you build some things up. Did you notice the term set over? I've set you over. Biblically, setting over was always the role of two entities. God has set over a people, a kingdom or a government. Government is set over people, to govern people. The other thing that is set over people is the military. Both involve a sword scripturally. Symbolically, the government yield, wields the sword, Romans 13. The military physically wields a sword. Notice this is what God has given Jeremiah to do, but his sword is not physical. Jeremiah, I'm gonna set you over governments and people like a military and a government and the sword I'm giving you is my word. For the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the, the heart, the thoughts of the heart, the intents of the soul. This is fascinating to me that the only thing God gives Jeremiah is his word and says, I'm gonna place you above nations, people, and kingdoms, governments, and you're gonna tear some things down and you're gonna build some things up. Did you know that's the same charge for you and I? You can't get away from this in scripture. Again, in the book of Corinthians, Paul would write, hey, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for what? Tearing down strongholds. You gotta pull down some strongholds, not only in your own life, things that have a stronghold on your mind, habits, patterns, addictions, they have a stronghold on you. And the only way to dismantle that stronghold is to actually tear it down with truth. And that's the word of God. So it's always gonna come back to knowing the Bible, knowing the truth so well, casting down arguments, conversations and communications and ideologies that lead to tension and strife. No, cast them down. They're distractions. Majority of the time that I bring up current cultural issues, I wanna equip you to not get lost in all of the distractions that can happen when you're engaging them the lies that come back in order to get you to engage them on an emotional basis. Well, no, there's no emotional argument to be had. I stand on objective truth, the absolute truth of the word, and that is what I am offering. That's what I am bringing. I'm not gonna spend time arguing with you, debating with you. It's the truth of God's word. You let it land like a seed being planted and you trust the outcome to him. That's that. Save a lot of you time going back and forth on Facebook, engaging people. You are not going to get anywhere on that medium. Plant the seed, let it go. And take that and package it and apply it even in verbal conversations. Non-believer at work, they're gonna come back with the flat earth theory. You're gonna have to go home and Google how the flat earth, now don't even say, hey, but look, we've come so far with technology, man. You can actually take a picture of the universe and see there's no such thing as a flat earth. The thing's a round ball in the sky. And by the way, the Bible has many verses that speak to the sphere of earth. So case closed, move on. Keep in mind, Jeremiah's task at hand 
is to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. And I referenced it last time we were together. I found it so amazing that in Jeremiah 18, the very same authority that God operates by, when he said he is the one that puts kingdoms and peoples and nations in place, and based on his prerogative, he will either have that nation or that kingdom be blessed and favored, but if they turn away from his truth, he is actually gonna reverse that blessing and allow it to become a curse. So he tears down what he had established to build up. And vice versa, he says any nation that is off, they're not following his truths, if they turn from their wicked ways, he will reverse the punishment and he will actually allow the blessing and the favor to fall in the way of rebuilding, in the way of planting. It's, it's, amazing. it's the same words. The same exact authority God has in his, his word is the authority that he gives Jeremiah. And I just was like, oh my goodness. Do I really believe as a minister of God's word that I'm actually speaking God's word? Like I'm actually, when I speak scripture, I'm actually speaking on the authority of God himself? I don't know if I believe that. Do we believe that? Paul says, when you speak, you're speaking the oracles of God. He said, when you serve, you're serving under the unction of the strength of God. Like this is as real as it gets, that's reality. Right, there's a lot of lies floating around, a lot of ideas that have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God, above the knowledge of God. And the only way to dismantle those lies is to rightly handle the word of truth. Do you know how to handle this sword? Do you know how to speak it in such a way there's authority and the God of this word substantiates the word of himself? And there's lies that need to be handled and dismantled by understanding truth. All right, Jeremiah, now here's the test. Verse 11, this is a pretty cool litmus test that God puts Jeremiah through. He says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree, it's a quaid. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am sequaid to perform my word. Okay, what just happened there? Before Jeremiah could speak as God speaks, he needs to see as God sees. That's the point. Before a minister can speak as God speaks, that minister or that Christian needs to see as God sees. And there's a reason why over the past two and a half years, ministers or Christians haven't been able to speak as God speaks because they don't see as God sees. And there are so many different instances in the past two and a half years where people have misappropriated or misjudged certain things happening in our world because they didn't see as God sees so they couldn't speak as God speaks. Or if they did speak, they spoke the opposite of what God intended for his church. And they championed an ideology of the world and the culture, that which was popular or politically correct, because they could not see as God sees. This is why before you speak for me, Jeremiah, I'm gonna test your vision. I'm gonna test your clarity. Jeremiah, what do you see? Jeremiah said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Such specificity, not just a branch, but an almond branch. Why? Well, uniquely in that particular area, even to this day, the almond tree is known as the wakeful tree, the hasty tree. It's a tree that does not wait until spring to sprung. It actually begins to bud earlier than every other crop every other tree, every other plant. So much so that even in the dead of winter, you begin to see the almond branch bud. So he sees it so specifically. And the reason why that is important because the Lord says to him, you've seen well, not just the branch, the wakeful branch, awaken. Then the Lord said to me, for I am, and he uses the same word that is given in the language of Hebrew, sequaid, which is amen, he, he uses that. God's like using poetry to affirm what Jeremiah saw. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see the sequade. And God says, you've seen well, I am about to sequade. You saw the tree that is known as the wakeful tree. I'm about to wake up and perform my word. This is so awesome. 
As if God's word was dormant to a certain point, he was waiting and the elements were coming into alignment. The prophet Jeremiah is dropped into human history and God says, do you see what I see? That's basically what verse 11 and 12 is saying. God is saying, do you see what I see? And I'm asking you, do you see what God sees? Can you hear him saying that in your conscience right now? Do you see as I see? Hey, the reason you're probably not speaking as I speak is because you don't see as I see. You're not able to speak truth into that scenario because you're not seeing it as I see it. If you don't see the scenario or relationship or situation as God sees it, you can't speak accurately into it. And not only can you not speak accurately into it, before we can speak with courage or speak courageously, we need to have vision of clarity. We need to see with clarity. There's no way Jeremiah can stand before a people who are gonna be hostile towards a message and speak with boldness unless he actually sees what God wants him to see. So he sees what God wants him to see. He's going to be able to do two things as a prophet, which again, I believe are applicable for the Christian. Even if there's no role or office of prophet today, I think there's still the spirit of the prophet because a prophet is supposed to either foretell or foretell. Write that down or remember it. What does a prophet do? He foretells, he tells something in advance. God said, hey, I'm about to do a work. And because God said it, it's gonna happen. I want you to tell people about it before it happens, prepare them, prime them, so that when it happens, they know I'm the one that did it. But a prophet also forth tells, tells things straight out. This is what Jeremiah does. This is what every Christian should do. We should foretell based on the word of God. Each of us should know how this book unfolds. We foretell it. I know exactly the direction the world is going in. I just don't know when God is gonna accomplish all that, but I could see the things taking form. I could see it as God sees it, so I could speak it as God speaks it. All right, Jeremiah, you see as I see, here we go. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot and it is facing away from the north. You see what he sees? He sees a pot that's boiling, it's heating up, okay? Picture a crucible or what is it called? A, a, a cauldron, a cauldron, picture that and the little spout, right? It usually has the lip. So he sees the lip is facing away from the north, which means it's facing towards the south. And as it's heating up, it's beginning to boil. It's beginning to almost foam at the top. And something's about to be poured out on the south. Remember, Judah is the southern kingdom. He sees it and then God interprets it. Watch this, verses 14 to 16. And the Lord said to me, out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls all around, against all the cities of Judah. Verse 16, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. All right, a lot just unfolded. I'm about to bring judgment from the north. Amazingly, Jeremiah kind of takes the baton of prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah, about a hundred years earlier, it's pretty cool because in your Bibles, it goes Isaiah, then Jeremiah. That's how can you remember it. Isaiah's prophecies set up Jeremiah's ministry. Isaiah prophesied about the eventual calamity that would come by two world empires. The first, Babylon. The second, the Medes. Why is that significant? Because when Isaiah said it, Babylon was not a world power. Babylon was just a, small group of people, the Assyrians were the ones that were in world power. So Isaiah is like, there's coming a time, like Assyria is now dealing with the Northern Kingdom, there's coming a time where Babylon is going to be the tool of God to punish the Southern Kingdom. And after Babylon, God calls a man by name, 
Hundreds of years before he was even born, he names him. His name's Cyrus. We call him Cyrus the Great. He was a Persian, and he would sit over the Medes and the Persians, and they would be useful to deal with Babylon. You know why God does that? He's like, I'm gonna use Babylon to deal with my people, then I'm gonna use the Medes and the Persians to deal with Babylon who deal with my people. Like, nobody's getting out of this. God is eventually going to get all of his retribution. I'm gonna be on his side when he's doing his judging. But one of the examples of judgment, did you catch it? People of the north, okay, that's gonna be Babylon. They're gonna come and they're going to set their throne in the gates. What is that? The throne is a position of authority. We know that a king sits on the throne, but it's also the placement of government, the throne. The gates were a unique spot, especially in their times where the elders of the city or the politicians of the city or the scribes, they would gather and they would conduct the affairs of their community. So there would be laws and policies that were written in the gates. The gates were symbolic of the security and the integrity of the entire land. Notice the people from the north, the Babylonians are gonna come and they're gonna set their thrones, their government in your gates. This is like a complete affront against the people of God that there's going to be an enemy that sits in their gates and actually exchanges their government for their government. So they have a government that was supposed to be of God, from God, for God, by God, is now going to be replaced by a government that is anti-God, against God, that is the greatest affront to God's people. That he's the one that was supposed to govern them and you don't want me? If you don't want me, I will allow your enemies to take my place. The Babylonians would assume the reins of government and of course, they would put the entire country under the godless laws of a pagan land. Quote, Experience teaches us that it is much easier to prevent an enemy from posting themselves than it is to dislodge them after they have gotten possession. It, let me say that again. Experience, history tells us that it is much easier to prevent an enemy from posting, from taking power, than it is to get rid of them after they've taken possession. You know who said that? George Washington said that first president of these United States. Well, how far have we fallen? Is there enemies in our gates? Is there godless governors and laws in place? Well, yeah. Okay, so I wanna introduce you to the fact that we are being judged in America. Present and active judgment. Jeremiah is like, I'm bringing charges verbally, but there's also gonna be indirect consequences of that judgment. They're gonna take their government and they're gonna sit in your government and they're gonna make their godless laws your laws. That is a form of judgment. And this is how God operates. When a nation does not want God in the public space, he will give that nation godless leaders in his place. Gosh, could have found countless videos and sound bites to drive this point home. Countless, too many to even sift through to show you when godless leaders take God's place in the public space and the result, this leader, this throne in the gate sums it all up exactly where we're at today. Check this out. Gender affirming care is life saving, medically necessary age appropriate and a critical tool for healthcare providers. As a pediatrician, when it comes to making sure kids are healthy and happy, I know how important care that affirmed someone's true identity can be. You don't want God in the public space? I will give you godless leaders in my place. If you caught what was put down, that is a male saying they're a female in a position of authority, government, namely the secretary or assistant secretary of health. And their occupation is pediatrician, which in Greek is healer of children, pediatrician, healer of children. And they were basically saying in a position of authority as a throne in the gate of our government, 
that gender affirming techniques, which is a, a safer way to say gender reassignment surgery, puberty blockers are good for your children. They are to be affirmed because that is their identity. And you might be going, what does that got to do with us? Jesus himself said, it will happen in our world that offenses will come. Woe to those whom the offenses come through. It would be better for that individual to have a millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the sea than for them, you ready? To cause the little ones to stumble. What you just watched on the screen is active judgment from God on our land. Not only active judgment, what you watched and what you listened to is one of the highest treasons against God. Not just one that is lost in their own sin, one that is trying to affirm the confusion and disorientation of our children. In the name of caring for children, do you understand that? Is God judging us? You don't want me in the public space? You don't want to talk about it? You want your faith and your politics completely separated? Okay, I will allow people with evil ideology to sit in the thrones in your gates and you're gonna have to deal with it. It is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God in the Bible. You know who said that? George Washington. Second president of the United States, John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. First chief justice of the United States, John Jay, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Why did he say that? Because it was a nation of Christians at the time. And the entire government framework was founded on Judeo-Christian values. And he was simply saying that if you want God to bless the land, you have to operate according to God's word. James Garfield, the 20th president of the United States, said this as a member of the House of Representatives on the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. That would be July 4th. 1876, now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. I've always stopped with that quote right there. I never read the whole thing until this message. He continues, if it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislator. If the next centennial, that's another 100 year anniversary, if the next 100 years does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. Translation, Christians have given up the throne which is the government, and we've no longer participated in the conversation in the gates, which is public discourse. All right, Jeremiah, I want you to go speak all of that and more at a time where the people were running amok, turning away. How can you do this? Final three verses. Look how intimate, awesome God is when he tasks us or calls us to do a work for him. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise. Speak to them all that I command you. He says it again. Do, do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. That's basically saying, if you choose to back down, then that response is going to bring dismay to you. But if you choose to stand before them and know that I'm with you, I will dismay them before you. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, government, against its princes, 
against its priest's religion, against the people. Nobody is left out of this. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. The imagery is remarkable but only because of the fact when the Babylonians come, they're gonna destroy the entire city. They're gonna destroy all of the structures. They're gonna tear down walls. They're going to destroy pillars. And all the while, God is saying, hey, I'm gonna make you a fortified city even though destruction's coming to the city. I'm gonna make you a bronze wall even though they're gonna b- break down the walls. I'm gonna make you what they should have been but destruction and judgment is coming and I need you to be my messenger, my ambassador. The message is not going to be received, but there has to be an opportunity for people to respond and repent. And they're gonna fight against you, Jeremiah, but they're not gonna prevail against you. Where else do you see that in the Bible that they shall not prevail? Something's not gonna prevail. Matthew 16, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. Right? It's almost like God is giving Jeremiah an individual personal task, an, an assignment, but it's the same assignment he's given the church. We are called to be a people of truth. We are called for such a time as this to do multiple things simultaneously. We tear down things that are wrong, off, evil. We tear them down. We uproot and weed out things that are harmful and we build up and we plant the truth in their place. We do so on an individual, personal level in our community, within the church, and then we take the same mission to the world. We are not dismayed by their faces because the one who sends us on this mission doesn't just give us his power, he gives us his presence. We have a greater fear of God than we should of man. There is really nothing in this world that could ever happen to you that was not co-signed, authored, authorized, allowed by God. Which means, when he said to the disciples, hey guys, persecution's about to happen, but I need you to remember this one thing. Do not fear what they can do to your body. They're gonna put handcuffs on your wrists. They're gonna whip your back. They're gonna mock you. Some of you are gonna lose your life. Don't fear what they can do to your body. Fear the one who can deal with both your body and destroy your soul in hell. And it wasn't a threat. He was simply saying, there's a lot at stake here. By the way, don't worry. See that bird? It's insignificant. You'd even notice it. That will not fall to the ground apart from your father's will. And oh, by the way, don't scratch your head. Don't be confused. The hairs you just scratched on your head, your father has them counted. He knows you intimately. Hairs on your head, birds falling from the sky, falling of a sparrow, dawning of tomorrow. God has it all in his hands. What can man do to you? Do not fear man. Do not fear speaking truth. You come with authority. Don't apologize for speaking truth. Do not shy away. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. You have been given life for such a time as this. As cool as it is to look at these characters in the Old Testament, the Bible, whether we're going through the book of Jeremiah, whether we're introduced to the prophet Daniel, whether we make our way to Nehemiah, and even the amazing account of Esther, all of these individuals were placed at the right place at the right time in human history to be useful to God, and so are you. And God never leaves himself without a witness. It might look like our entire land is crumbling. Where is God at? And I'm saying he's in you and he wants to speak through you and he's placed you here in this context for such a time as this. You are his witness, you are his ambassador, but don't forget the fact that he never leaves himself without a witness and he never leaves that witness without his presence, never. So what's gonna happen next, I'll tell you, and I would love for you to read ahead because most of Jeremiah's writings, they're one, hard to date. When did he say this? What was going on in the culture? But a lot of the writings form, they turn out to be sermons. Which I'm like, that's pretty stinking cool. Why am I spending all time writing my own sermons? I could just get up here and read chapter two. 
chapter two, all the way through to chapter three, the first five verses is a sermon. But guess who's the author of the sermon? It's God. And all he wants Jeremiah to do is repeat what he already said. And you'll notice God has a sense of humor when you read his sermon. His sermon is a siren. And it's not just prose, it's poetry. And he begins to talk about their idolatry and how they've rejected him and how he gave them over to that rejection. And he gave them over to a foreign government. And now there's consequences. But no doubt throughout the book, there's a constant clarion call to return, come back. You're never too far gone to come back. You're never too down deep and stuck to come back. And like, that's the lesson for each of us today. I don't know what your context is, but God is saying, hey, return to me. Come back to me. Come back for healing. Come back for comfort. You haven't had peace in weeks. You've been trying to do life on your own. You're scattered, you're anxious, you're worried. Come back, return, repent. Change your mind about how you're living. And all the while, God is waiting to receive his people. That's personal. That's communal. And that's also true for a country. But it starts with a person, right? It starts with one person, one gal, one, one guy going, you know what? I'm returning. I wanna see as God sees. I wanna speak as God speaks. I wanna be courageous. I wanna be clear I wanna be for Christ. Let's pray. So Father, we looked into your word. I pray it was clear for your people that they would learn and grow in their walk and that it truly would not just be another message, another sermon, but it would be equipment for the days ahead that would become more like Christ. We would grow in our faith be mature believers for these days. Be willing to speak truth boldly and clearly because we love. We want to see souls saved as you saved us. God, that we would get off our holy horse. We would be boots on the ground, ministers for you, ambassadors sent forth to a people who are hostile, rebellious. And God, you know my heart. I'll show a video to poke fun at somebody else's confusion or sin or shame. But God, to show your people that we are being judged, there's only one response in judgment, and that's repentance. So we turn back to you. We ask for your favor to fall again on your people, and it would start with the church. It would start with this church and these Christians. Mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, children of all ages would come back return to the authority of your word, then you would do the work and you would make much of yourself and we would glorify you for the outcome. So there's no other name, no name more beautiful, no name more holy, no name more powerful, no name. What a beautiful name. And it's in that name that we pray, amen.